Go ahead, you can start. Good morning. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is not Bill Rossum, as you some would expect, but uh, it's uh, my name is Torin Pop. But I still have the great pleasure and honor to introduce the invited speaker uh, of today, uh, which is Martin Voralik. Uh, Martin is coming originally from Czech Republic, where he graduated from the Czech Technical University. And then he moved to France, uh, where he got his PhD at the University of Paris uh, South. And um, after a, a postdoctoral time, uh, he uh, is now an, a professor at Sorbonne University and also actually his main employ employment is as a senior researcher at INRIA in Paris. Martin is well known for his work on, on a, posteri a posteriori error estimates, uh, adaptive methods and uh, so numerical work on various fields of uh, partial differential equations and in particular uh, related to porous media uh, problems, which of course uh, is the reason for which he is now an invited speaker here. Uh, I don't want to steal his, uh, the show because he has way many more uh, interesting things to say than me. So I give the floor to Martin. Please, Martin. Okay, thank you very much, Sorin. Um, hello to everyone. Uh, probably the good thing to say is say good morning, good afternoon, good evening to, to cover all the globe. Uh, thanks also for the organizers. Uh, I really appreciate that they uh, made it through and put uh, the Interpor uh, in online form. And then it's a great pleasure for me to um, show you some of our recent work. So I'll try to share my screen with you. Is it fine, Sorin? Can you confirm, please? I think everything is perfect. Okay, great. So let me please go into the talk which uh, will be about a posteriori or estimate and the use of adaptivity in terms of solvers for porous media flows. It's a joint work with many collaborators and you will see uh, uh, the names later in the talk. Uh, I would like to uh, start uh, with um, a quick introduction. Just saying the context will be that of multi-phase, multi-composition flows in porous media. So mathematically unsteady, nonlinear, and systems of partial differential equations. And uh, I will not address it in the talk, but I just wanted to make a point that we can take into account in the framework of phase appearance and disappearance or mathematically inequality constraints. One point I would like to say in general is as well that uh, I'm trying to address um, discretizations by basically arbitrary scheme and also address meshes of the form that you can see here, polygonal in 2D or polyhedral in 3D. I've prepared this, this example. I will spend some time on it. I would like to show you for a model problem. So it's a steady but nonlinear single phase Darcy flow. So where the diffusion tensor can depend on your pressure head. I would like to show you uh, how typically one attacks this problem with numerical discretizations and what are some of the issues that may arise. So whenever you have such a problem and you discretize it by your favorite uh, numerical method, you turn it into a problem of finding a vector that is uh, n-dimensional real valued vector such that some nonlinear operator applied to the vector is a source step that corresponds to the discretization of the source here. In practice, typical way how to numerically attack the solution of this nonlinear algebraic equation system is to introduce an iterative linearization. So you pick an iteration index k and you build a matrix linearization of this problem out of the previous k minus one state so that now the problem is to solve a system of linear algebraic equations. And numerically, one very popular and uh, uh, powerful way how to do this is to pick an iterative algebraic solver 
And then on each step I of the solver, you uh, can uh, obtain an approximation. So once again, a vector of n dimensions in R that is your approximation to this unknown pressure hat P and that satisfies this equation up to algebraic residual. I believe that everyone that has ever tried numerics for this toy nonlinear problem has gone through that. So let me now point some of the issues that I believe are very commonly present. So first of all, mathematically, if I wanted to get this P, I would need to iterate both in K and in I up to infinity, which is of course impossible in practice. So you stop at some point earlier. And one particular consequence is that at this point, even if your scheme was mass balance conservative, now it's lost. So this is the first point. The second point, okay, if you want to stop a little earlier these iterations in K and in I, you need to decide how. For instance, here, for the algebraic solver, if you use some of the common packages, very probably the criterion will be to take this vector here, take its L2 norm and make it maybe relative. When this number is small, then you stop. In turn, for this other procedure for linearization here, very often you just compare what is the current iterate with the previous one and you may even consider other norms like infinity. When this number is small, then you stop. You may see from the difference here and here, relative, non-relative, that at least in such a setting, it's not really a good thing to do because you're really comparing very different things, apples and oranges. And finally, so I've mentioned that this is your numerical approximation to this object here. I think until today, really very rarely for me the extremely important question is answered how far is this approximation from this true solution in other words typically you don't do any control of whether what you obtain is in some way close to what you like to have so this is exactly three points that motivate an approach that we uh, are um, pursuing uh, for now quite some time and whose goals can be resumed us on this slide. So first of all, say for the error in the true unknown Darcy flux and the approximation that you obtain from your computer, say on the mesh age, on the time step N, on linearization step K and then solve step I, we are able to develop a framework which gives you a number where this number is this a posteriori error estimate, and the number is an upper bound, actually guaranteed upper bound, so greater than equal than this unknown error. And moreover, you see that this number is actually decomposed into components of the error, the space discretization, the time discretization, the linearization, and the algebra. Last point to do with point two above, actually, in this setting, all of these numbers here are perfectly comparable. They all have the same physical units. They all speak about the error in the fluxes as written here. Of course, to use this in practice, you need that these estimators are uh, easy to code, fast to evaluate, and in a way, very simple or friendly to, to use in, in practice. One of the points I would like to address in particular is the presence of these two error components here, the estimate of the algebraic error and of the linearization error to do what I like to call full adaptivity, an adaptivity that not only concerns mesh or time step, but also the solvers. And one very last point that has to do with my item one above, the loss of mass balance. I will not really address it in details, but I would like to stress that the methodology that I'm presenting is intrinsically connected with answering the question, but where the mass balance is gone. So we can recover it up to working precision when we do the procedure of apples to estimate giving this thing. So uh, I would like to uh, 
I would like to uh, show you essentially some results for a toy linear problem, then spend quite amount of time, especially on this adaptivity of linear and nonlinear solvers, and finally show you extensions to what I've mentioned was the motivation and context, multi-phase, multi-composition flows. So the first part, model steady linear flow. So now there is no dependency of this diffusion on the pressure head with the unknowns being the pressure head and alpha theory, the Darcy velocity flux minus K grad P. To show you uh, one of the things I've mentioned that we try to do things in a framework that allows you to take into account basically any numerical scheme and any mesh. Let's see the situation where the mesh elements are these general polygons or polyhedrons and where your scheme will give you an approximation of the pressure head in the element and then for each phase of the mesh an approximation of the flux. There are many of such schemes uh, and essentially this covers any locally conservative method because the only thing we request that the sum of the fluxes equals the discretization of the source term. What is interesting that in such a wide general framework you can achieve the goals that I've highlighted at the beginning, you can find a number, which is this thing here, the estimate, which is greater than equal than the unknown error. And moreover, the number can be obtained in a very simple, easy way. So you just have some three small matrices, mesh element by mesh element. You multiply them with what are your flux and pressure vectors known given in your scheme, and you get the number, you get the guaranteed upper bound, the error is less than or equal to the estimate. And the fact that the estimate takes this form is this important point. The price you pay for knowing how big is the error is really negligible at this moment. A tiny example how this can work in practice. An example of a steady linear Darcy flow with known solution. When you know the solution, mesh element by mesh element, you can compute how big the error is. This is here on the left and on the right, uh, sorry, this is the, the exact one is the here on the, on the right. And on the left is what the methodology I've shown you uh, gives you as an estimate of the year. So this would be in a general context of these local conservative methods. Another example may be say standard conforming finite elements and some numbers just to show you how uh, First, very important question can be addressed, how large is the overall error in your numerical simulation? We may take steady linear Darcy flow, a sequence of meshes and a polynomial degrees. And for a model problem, see how the estimator and error evolve. So we see this is the unknown error known because we now have a model problem with known P. This will be the error and that's the estimate. If you want in relative numbers, 24% and we estimate it by 28%, which is not too bad. And a nice point is actually the quality of the estimate. So the ratio of this estimate over error actually improves with mesh refinement. And it actually also improves with polynomial degree refinement, which is these numbers here, polynomial degree two, three, and four. You can also see that on coarse meshes and coarse polynomial degrees, the relative error even for toy problems may be rather big, but doing the right thing, uh, especially refining both in H and in P can bring you to rather very nice insurance that the error is at most 10 to the minus 6% relative and indeed your estimate is very, very close to what is the true error. So let me now go to the core of the talk. Uh, let me make it through first, how can I use these estimates to produce something that uh, will work faster, the adaptivity. Let's do first more, the, the more usual ones, mesh and polynomial degree, and later on, maybe the less common one, the adaptivity of linear and nonlinear solver. So adaptivity is essentially taking this these pictures, what I estimate where the error is, 
and what is reality and saying okay if the error is say here around the, the center let's concentrate the work there let's either refine the mesh or increase the polymerity there mathematically you typically select those regions with increased error refine the mesh there it means you don't refine the mesh everywhere and mathematically there are two uh, very exciting things you can prove that such a thing such a such a method converges so the sequence of approximate solutions indeed approximates the unknown exact one and this can happen even if the mesh size the maximum mesh element does not go to zero and you can even prove that <coughs> the error decays at an optimal rate so something like mesh size to the power of the polynomial degree but now written in terms of degrees of freedom an extremely exciting thing is that in contrast to the usual things where the high order only pays for smooth solutions this is now true for both smooth and singular solutions so maybe an illustration still the same problem where the error was concentrated around the origin and the adaptivity the use of the aposter estimate is that you refine the mesh where the error was and you can also increase the polynomial degree so that you can approximate this unknown solution in the good way well this would be the case of a smooth solution and in the case of a singular solution you see there's much more pronounced the adaptivity in age mesh refinement towards a problem combined with polynomial degree increase so let me uh, go to the question of solvers this is what I've shown you in, in the motivation framework. We now have a problem where there is a mesh, now indexed by L, where there is a linearization scheme indexed by K and iterative algebraic solver indexed by I. What we can obtain are a posterior estimates for this given solution and the error between this and the true unknown solution in terms of these computable estimates that distinguish this the error component so that's the estimate then how do you do adaptivity out of it well essentially it's you take the algebraic error and you say i don't want it to be 10 to the minus 8 you just say i want it 10 times smaller than these two here and then you take the linearization error and similarly you just say i want it roughly 10 times more than this one so that's the adaptivity of the linear solver and of the nonlinear solver. And finally, mesh adaptivity or polynomial degree is that you take the elements where these estimators are big and you concentrate the effort there. An exciting thing is that also now in the framework of nonlinear problems and inexact solvers, you uh, can prove mathematically both that these objects converge to the true one so that's a convergence and you can even prove again an optimal error decay with respect to the number of degrees of freedom and even one step further you can mathematically prove that such a use of aposter estimation and adaptivity gives you the fact that this sequence of approximate solution converges to this true solution the best possible way in terms of how much you pay in numerics in terms of overall computational cost so let me illustrate this to you again on examples first of all a linear problem where i'm just addressing the fact that the system of linear algebraic equations is not solved exactly so that i have total error discretization error and algebraic error in the picture language this is what is the true total error and this is how we estimate it this is what is the algebraic error and this is how we estimate it so you can feel that we have a good idea of how things are going this allows us then to estimate the discretization error by this number the algebraic error in blue by upper and lower estimates and then the total error this allows us to do the solver adaptivity and the solver adaptivity is that you stop in this setting after four iterations and you don't wait until the algebraic error goes to some number that is very very small i would like to show you now the 
full picture, hopefully, where we now address a system that comes from a nonlinear PDE. So this non stay steady, but nonlinear Yarsi flow. That includes the linearization, so once again the index K, and algebraic solver, the index I. We now have on each stage, so on each mesh, on each uh, Newton step K, on each algebraic step I, numbers for estimating the total error, do the algebraic error, the linearization error, and the discretization error. So it's kind of, we get a picture how things are going, and we can make these triple adaptivity. First of all, adaptivity of algebraic solver. We stop when the algebraic error in green is say just 10 times smaller than this one. It means after 30 iterations and not after 600 iterations as you would do in usual. The same for linearization error. You stop when this linearization error is just a fraction smaller than the other components. So you stop much earlier than you would do usually. And you have one number per your computational mesh, triangle in this case, which estimates how big the error is in terms of spatial distribution so that to do mesh adaptivity, so that to adjust the mesh to what it should be. Now the outcome of this triple adaptivity is that you make your error decrease, say first in terms of degrees of freedom, in a much faster way than you would do if you only did the usual thing, uniform mesh refinement and say quasi-exact solve. Moreover, that was the computational cost thing. You can say how big is the price you pay for the things. So for each of these dots here, I plot how much I paid in terms of iterations of algebraic solver. So say for this last uniform mesh, I paid something like 550 algebraic solver iterations here. And it turns out, and that's, that's the um, amazing thing, that not only if you do adaptivity, you say for the same mesh, you reach much better precision, but you pay for this much better precision, a much smaller number, which is expressed here. So in numbers, if you do standard usual uh, uniform mesh refinement and no adaptivity, this may be the total number you paid in cost, the number of iterations, and it corresponds to this precision here. And this is what you pay for doing adaptivity. So something that is much smaller error, just 1%, and it actually even costs less. So for me, that's a kind of commercial adaptivity in this setting means pay less and get more. Pay less because there's much reiterations and get more because there's much better precision. Okay, we can address errors in quantities of interest. I think I will just um, uh, skip this example, but it was to say that we can say, say how big the error is in the outflow. And I would like to just show you um, one movie and two examples for uh, the applications to challenging porous media flows. So you start with two phase, where you can now put all of that into box and start the box. And obtain something like this. Obtain a numerical procedure that does adaptive mesh refinement. So it's now a time dependent problem. The uh, front advancing and the mesh is adaptive. That makes a time step adjustment longer or shorter as needed, but it also monitors the error from linearization and from algebra, stops the solvers at the point where these errors are just say 10 times smaller than the rest, so that you uh, steer the, in this case, GMRS and Newton solvers in <coughs> a fully adaptive procedure that now <coughs> typically proceeds uh, uh, much, much faster than the usual ones. The speed ups are something like order of 15 and stuff like that. And we can do this also for more challenging problems. Just a small example, not a two phase, but three phase, three components, black oil, now in three space dimensions, and essentially 
the same type of things. The knowledge of the error, the components allows you to stop much earlier, stop after say 20 in place of 60 iterations of linear solver and spare many, many iterations, both of linear and linearization solver. Uh, yeah, there are some, some, some numbers that we try to report as clearly as possible in comparing what was the industry standard, the best that the engineers at the French Petro Institute could do, and what we can achieve with these a posterior error estimates and adaptivity in terms of solvers and meshes. So if I should uh, make uh, some wrap up, the a posterior estimates, first of all, allow for me one crucial thing. They allow you to say how big is the error in your simulation. But they can do much, much more. They can typically lead to full adaptivity that steers your numerical simulation in terms of meshes, polynomial degrees, time step, linear solver and nonlinear solver. With that, you can also do much faster than usual. And for me, an additional beautiful point to that, the methodology is also connected to the fact that this allows you to obtain mass balance of order of meshing precision at any step, uh, which is not the usual case. Well, we are working on a lot of mathematical questions, convergence and optimality proof. We are working on further applications to challenging problems in particular, multi-phase, multi-compositional and phase transition problems in, in process media. Yeah, I would like to thank you for your attention and uh, I'm open for your questions. Uh, thank you. Um, William Rosen, you may go ahead. Thank you. I, I, I would like to uh, start first of all by apologizing to our speaker and um, and to all of you in the audience. There, there really is no excuse for my not, not being here at the start. Um, if, I, if I may, belatedly, let me read the introduction that should have been given uh, about a half an hour ago. Um, Martin Vorelich is a senior researcher at INRIA, the French National Institute for Informatics and Mathematics. He is the leader of the research team Serena, stimula Simulation for the Environment, Reliable and Efficient Numerical Algorithms. He works on numerical discretization and partial differential equations and specializes in a posteriori error estimates and adaptivity. His particular interests are the reliability of the overall numerical simulation process and the efficient use of computational resources, often for porous media applications. He received his PhD in 2004 from the Czech Technical University in Prague and the University of Paris South in Orsay, France. He later worked as an associate professor at the Sorbonne in Paris. He has co-supervised a dozen PhD and postdoc students in served as a member of several international conference committees. He also currently serves on the editorial boards of Acta Polytechnica, Applications of Mathematics, and Siam Journal on Numerical Analysis. He has published over 60 peer-reviewed papers. In 2015, he earned a prestigious ERC Consolidator grant. Okay, what I, what I would like to do is um, ask the audience, please, if you would um, uh, if you would raise your questions either, well, best of all through the session Q&A or through the chat, I can monitor those equally. Um, I'm not sure I'm, I'm, uh, how it works if you raise your hand. So the surest thing, even if you just uh, like send me a message, raise hand in the session Q&A or the chat, I will get it. We have a question by Benoit newton -Jay. Uh, dear Martin, thanks for this clear talk. What about strongly unstable flows, gravity, viscous fingering, etc.? Okay, thank you for, for the question. So, of course, I don't want to claim that we can treat absolutely everything. You've seen that many of the results we have more on the mathematical side are for problems that may be nasty, degenerate, but they don't include this fingering or other things uh, really complicated for porous media. On the other hand, we have addressed some of those and typically that's the mesh adaptivity that helps you to follow the front and um, 
uh, do adaptivity in this setting. What stays always, also for such problems, we can give you a Naposter estimate, a number that says the maximum error in your simulation is this. Unfortunately, the more complicated the problem is, the more pessimistic our answer is. So we may say the, the, um, the we guarantee that the error is less than, and then we give you 1000%, which of course is not probably very meaningful for extremely tough problems. So this is roughly the setting of the theory. The more challenging it is, probably the, the more pessimistic answer we'll give you, uh, and uh, this will not probably satisfy you. That's my idea. Other questions? Well, let, let me um, try to stimulate some. Or, uh, uh, I think there are uh, two questions in, in raise hand. Pardon? Um, I see two participants raise hand. I have no idea what does it mean. Um, okay, I well, let me just say if you have uh, raised your hand, uh, please uh, speak up. Um, let me know who you'd like to call on. There's Laurent. I'm seeing now. I'm sorry. I'm seeing okay, now how to, how to do this. Laurent Orgogoza, would you uh, care to ask a question? Laurent, I think your mic is on now. It's a little bit tricky in this format. It might be, yeah. it may not always work. Okay. Well, let us, let us, uh, Laurent, do if you, do you hear me? Yes. Ah, do you hear me now? now? Yep. Okay, great. Um, my question is about the computational cost of the error estimates procedure mm -hmm. and uh, how, it, uh, how it depends on the physical complexity of the problem and of the size of the problem in terms of mm -hmm. mesh size and so on. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, yeah. Thank you for the question. So I would say that's one of the good points of the, of the theory we've developed. I've shown you essentially how does the estimator looks like for a toy linear problem. And essentially you've got some little matrices, mesh element by mesh element that you multiply by some vectors that are already available. So the pressure and fluxes on the mesh and this local matrix five by five times vector multiplication is the number. This is exactly the same for whatever the problem is. Two-phase, multi-phase, compositional inequalities, all the time the price is this. So that's a good point of the theory. The price is always, it, it does not depend on, on the complexity of the problem. It's always the same, it's always optimal. It's really negligible in terms of all the things that you need to do to solve your problem. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, Sorin Pop, I believe you have a question. Yes, indeed. Um, hello again. Hello, Martin, again. Uh, first of all, thanks for, for the very interesting talk. And um, I really appreciate the way you, pre you, you show that it is important to consider various aspects, uh, various error sources, not only focus on one. Uh, one uh, question is related to the um, presentation on your on nonlinear problems, mm -hmm. where you have to, have to iterate when solving uh, such problems. So my question is, how much would the location of the error change during iterations? Yeah. Okay. Uh, very good question. So essentially, if I should say uh, one phrase. Uh, it, it can be whatever. Uh, so that's, of course, the complexity of the problem. One of the examples, this was the total error for a linear problem. You see it's located around the rendering corner and the algebraic error is completely elsewhere. There are two different, so there's two components of the same error, but they are completely different and distributed. And moreover, they can change, so this algebraic one, or later on, uh, the 
linearization one, they can change from iteration to iteration. The good point is that at least numerically, we typically observe such a match between what is the exact one here on the right and what is the approximate one. So even if the exact one changes iteration to iteration, the approximate one follows it closely. And you may have spotted this on this nonlinear problem uh, where all of the things are in it, algebra, linearization, and um, spatial, discretization, spatial distribution of the error. And still you can see, we can predict that the error was mainly around the corner here, and then maybe on the big elements here and there. Again, this can change from iteration to iteration, especially in terms of the linearization and algebra. Again, this can be true what you were saying. Martin, it, it appears you're referring to points on a slide. Are you, are you meaning to share your screen at this point? Because I don't. Ah, oh, sorry. Yes. Yeah, I stopped sharing the screen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, but for me, it was clear actually what he was meaning. Uh, okay. So, uh, yeah. That okay. Was it. Yeah, that was the. That was the. Um, uh, yes. Thing that uh, uh, even with linear algebra error uh, and linearization error the estimates we have can predict where the error is. It was here around the entering corner and maybe in, in the big elements. And the other thing, uh, yeah, sorry, I was showing is that um, for whenever you have more components of the error, each component can be distributed completely differently. So that was the example for the problem with singularity where one error is somewhere here, the total or the discretization and the linear algebra looks completely different. Even though this is the case, our estimates, things which are here on the left, seem to match pretty perfectly. You see, including very small features, what is the reality, even if the reality is changing, say, step to step. Yes, thank you very much, Martin. Thank you. OK, additional. Um... Additional questions, either raise your hand or send them to the chat or Q&A. Ah, excuse me, there is. Um, okay, Soren, Bob, I noticed you've also sent something to the chat. Is that the same question you just raised? Sorry, yes, it was exactly the same question. Thank okay. you very much for giving me the chance to ask it. Thank you, yes. yes. Well, I, I will uh, ask a question really to uh, hope to give folks a moment or two to think of uh, their own questions. In, in When you refer in your talk to the exact error estimate and the um, uh, estimated error estimate, is the exact error estimate based on a higher resolution numerical scheme or are these cases where you have an analytical solution? Yeah. Uh, Thank you. Whenever I referred to exact, like here on this slide, I, uh, it was a case with analytical solution available so that we can plot what is really the error and then things on the left are always the estimators, those that you can obtain for, uh, as I've answered a while ago, uh, uh, very uh, acceptable price in any setting. So it was always a comparison of reality on the right and estimate, computational estimate on the left. Oh, okay. Um, one impressive point I, I saw from a couple of slides, I think on slides nine and 15, it appeared that every case that you were showing, your estimated errors were greater than or equal to the actual, which is reassuring um, if you know for making an estimate it's nice to know that if it is a an upper bound is there a analytical reason why these uh, you know why your estimates would would they always be guaranteed to be an upper bound of the actual of the actual error? yes so that's very much on the mathematical side that was the work over the years to really guarantee that if we say that this computable number, the estimate has something to do with the error. The relation is that it is indeed greater or equal than the unknown error. So it's always guaranteed that, that, that the word, the English word guaranteed means that it's not just 
an estimate to give you an idea, but that it's a number that is greater than or equal than the unknown error. And that holds true in all the situations I've been showing, including the nonlinear time dependent problem. Okay. Laurent, I noticed, I think your hand is raised again. Is, do you have another question you would like to ask? Yes. Uh, I would like to know whether there would be more difficulties uh, to apply this uh, apostrophe or estimate for massively parallel computation with the domain decomposition of thousand, thousands of uh, subdomains or uh, would it be straightforward as for um, um, uh, monoprocessor um, computations? Mm -hmm. Yes, um, there is uh, no problem with this. Uh, massively parallel computation, it's typically just one way how you solve those linear problems by domain decomposition. And that is what is taken into account in the framework. We did a couple of contributions uh, specifically to uh, this mass massively parallel simulation and the, the answer is the estimates go through in absolutely the same way. So if I go back one step to your question, the, the first one, uh, this methodology works really basically in any setting, any method, uh, any solver, massively parallel or not. You always get a guaranteed upper bound, but as you highlighted well in your first question, if your problem uh, is extremely nasty, then this number on the right may way importantly overestimate the error. But that's that's uh, kind of the, the, the thing you expect somewhere to appear. It's not a miracle box that does everything every time, all the time, everywhere. If the problem is nasty, you still get a guaranteed upper bound, but the bound may be much, much bigger than the error. That's, that's what you expect to appear at some point. It's not a miracle, but it hopefully allows to do many things, including massively parallel implementations. There's no problem for, for this. And would, have, uh, would, would it be possible to have local uh, a posteriori error uh, estimation? I mean, for each domain decomposition, and so make the adaptivity different for each process? Yes, uh, I think this is very much connected to these pictures I've been showing. This for a model problem is what is the exact error here on the right. This is what we estimate. It would be the same <clears throat> if you say have uh, subdomains like this one and this one. You can just sum the contributions of the error estimates here in the subdomain. And um, that would be the idea of how big is the error in that part of the domain. You can either do it mesh element by mesh element or computational subdomain by computational subdomain. It's absolutely no problem with that. Thank you. You're welcome. Other, other questions, please again, send them to chat or to session Q and A or raise, raise your hand. I have uh, another question again, just to, uh, I give folks a little bit more time to, and, uh, I think it might have been slide nine, but anyway, you had relative errors of 10 to the minus 6%. Mm. Quite impressive. I'm wondering, is this uh, error in pressure, an absolute pressure, and were these cases where the absolute pressure was quite large? Um, I mean, is, is, yes, is this the error in absolute pressure or no, it looks like it's relative to the pressure gradient. Now yes. That I, so okay. This, this is what you're asking. This was a yeah. steady linear Darcy. And you look on the energy error in the pressure and you scale it to make it relative by the size of the pressure gradient. And then you give a relative number that has a meaning in percent. And the fact that it goes to this very small relative percent is that you do both mesh refinement and polyamine degree increase. You see that appears for high polyamine degrees. That's the power of polyamine increase, 0.1. But once again, 0.2, it's also connected with the fact that it's a toy model problem. I would not give you 10 to the minus six in relative precision for uh, uh, some problem with viscous fingering in porous media. That's, that's it, that's the trade-off. For a highly complicated problem, I will also give you 
a guarantee on the relative precision, but it may be more in the size of tens or even hundreds of percents uh, and not in the size of 10 to the minus six percents, which I can achieve for a toy problem. Okay. Soren yeah. Popek raised your hand. Yep, there's also a question in the um, Q&A, a new one. I don't know if you've seen that. Okay, I'm not, that's funny. Mine's not, uh, but please, uh, host, please. Uh, I, I can read it for you, yes. It's a question asked by Timur uh, Merambayev. He asks, what do you think about error indicators for reactive transport problems? Have you applied error indicator any real world data? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you for the question. I would say reactive transport is mathematically better off than uh, say viscous fingering in the sense that for reactive things we can mathematically prove something this is connected with this word in my conclusion robustness we can achieve the same quality of the estimate independently of the size of the reaction phenomena of uh, how how big uh, are the reaction phenomena in comparison with uh, the diffusion or dispersion phenomena? So with that, we are much better off mathematically. And then typically in these relative precisions, we go to beautifully small percents again. Okay, and Soren, I noticed that, uh, that you have, I think, raised your hand again. Yes, this is true. Uh, thanks for giving me the chance to ask a second question. Um, this is a bit related to what Bill was asking. Um, I'm wondering uh, if you have one problem, you, has, you set what a problem, and then uh, if you apply different discretization methods, mm -hmm. would the error di distribution be totally different, or can it be that they are, uh, the error distribution would be different? Yes, it can be. And um, that's connected with the fact that the framework I'm presenting, it's not a black box. It's not the same for all the methods. It needs information for what is your method. And then it tells you what is our estimate for the error. So for different methods, we could possibly get uh, uh, different distributions of the error. I would say that said, uh, if you have a problem with singularity, like uh, maybe uh, this, these corner singularities here, if the error is really concentrated, uh, maybe I think it was here, you see it's almost zero in most of your computational domain and then non-zero along the singularity, I would imagine that this would be the same for any numerical method. Yes, thank you. Other I questions? Think, I think we are out of time. Okay. Well, if you would like okay, to well, close thank the thank session. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Vorlich, for a really impressively comprehensive examination of these issues of error minimization and accurate simulation. Thank you very much. Thank you.